Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Manasseh Ben Israel Institute as its director, and on behalf of its supporters, the University of Amsterdam and the Jewish Historical Museum, I would like to welcome you all to uh, already the fourth and the last lecture of our series caught up uh, in the clash of civilizations, Jewish culture between East and West. Um, I am very honored to be able to introduce to you today uh, Professor Yirmiyahu Yovel. Uh, professor Yovel is an emeritus professor from the University of Jerusalem, and presently he is Hans Jonas Professor still at the New School of Social Research in New York. Um, he, Jovel wrote on many philosophical topics, but also with a historical interest. Um, he, uh, he is a, a Kant specialist and wrote on Kant, the um, book Kant and the uh, Philosophy of History. He also wrote on the relation uh, between uh, Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche, Hegel and the Jews, the um, book The Dark Riddle, Nietzsche, uh, Hegel and Nietzsche on the Jews. Uh, and um, I uh, have to admit that I know him mostly for his Spinoza work. He is also a very important Spinoza specialist. And on this, he wrote uh, Spinoza and Other Heretics, uh, two books. Uh, it's a work uh, that, that, um, that exists of two books. Uh, in this work, he did not only show his ability to combine historical writing with philosophical analysis, he also showed that he could do this in a surprisingly fluent and easily accessible style. In the books, uh, he explained Spinoza's thought as a product of his Marano background and argued for the Spino uh, importance of Spinoza or of his philosophy of imminence for the development of modern thought. Jovell continued to work on Spinoza, for instance, translating Spinoza's most important work, The Ethics, into Hebrew, which became immediately a bestseller in Israel, and Jovell's latest book, um, which I have here, and which you can buy, <laughs> uh, The Order Within, The Marados, Split Identity and Emerging Modernity. Um, in this book, Jovell went further back, writing not on Spinoza, but on his, the culture of his forefathers, the Maranos. Uh, again, he is not afraid to develop far-reaching ideas and puts forth uh, sweeping thesis, the sweeping thesis that the origins of modernity should be found in the Marano culture. Uh, this will also be the subject of today's lecture. Uh, please welcome uh, Professor Jovell. Good evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Wertheim. I am very grateful for this uh, honor honorable invitation to speak at the Menasseh Ben Israel Institute. Very fitting place for a topic like mine, because Menasseh Ben Israel was epitomized, more or less, the Marano uh, culture and faith and uh, vicissitudes in more than a single way. I have announced a different topic for, my, for this lecture, and uh, it was about the Marano's influence on Greek, on, uh, sorry, on uh, Spanish culture in the, in the Golden Age. But I realized later on that not everyone knows what Marano's are and what their culture was. So I will speak more now about a few aspects of the history the characterization and the possible influence of this Marano culture. And I will ask to those of you who already are very familiar with the phenomenon to bear with me when I explain to those who are not what the story is all about. Of course, Moranos were known 
as Jews who have converted either by force or by the, by, or, or by the pressure of circumstances into Christianity, Catholicism, in Spain and Portugal uh, in the late Renaissance. They and their descendants. They were also known as conversos and as new Christians. These are varieties of the same, of the same title, which I will use in, in my book I use synonymously. They were known for a very long time. When I was a, ch a child, they were known as secret Jews, Jews living in the underground, crypto Jews, hiding, being completely Jews in, on the inside and putting on a front, only a facade of an appearance of Christianity, Catholic Christianity on the outside. And of course, they, they were taking risks. They were persecuted by the Inquisition. They were burnt by the Inquisition when they were found out. And there is a lot of, there were a lot of stories of heroism and sacrifice and suffering and greatness around this with a certain romanticization. I grew up on those stories. And I think all my generation grew up on those stories, which were very uplifting. And which are not completely, not, which are not completely untrue but they don't fit, they don't square when you become critically, critical philosophically and historically and psychologically. They don't square with the psychology and phenomenology of the human mind. I became curious about the Morales when I was working on Spinoza. That's true, what you were told now. I found out that he came from a Morano community this community, the, the community of the Portuguese Amster, here in Amsterdam grew up in the Portuguese community. Amsterdam at that time, as you may know, many of you probably know, was considered the Jerusalem of the, of the West. It was the capital of the Moranos coming back to Judaism after several centuries in which they were living as Christians in Spain and in Portugal and opening up where they could, where they were allowed to, when, where, where the authorities welcomed them, which was very, very rare. And Amsterdam was the, uh, the, perhaps the utmost example, opening up Jewish communities again, their own Jewish communities. Judaism of the new Jews. They were not Jews in an ordinary way, in which, which continues the tradition, which is integral with the, with the past. They were Jews after a break. They, were, they broke twice, their history, broke twice with their culture. At first when they converted into Christianity, then when they lived, and I will analyze later on, the complexity and the dualities of their lives it was not as simple as the legend has told us, the romantic legend. They were breaking with, with their old tradition. They were not completely integrating with the new tradition, so they were, broke, they were broken with themselves. They were split. The subtitle of my book on the Moranos is Split Identity and Emerging Modernity. There was a split cultural identity and often also a split personal identity in the meantime. And then there was a new break, a new break with their Marano culture in Iberia, which was Catholic officially and which the whole education was Catholic. They broke with that and became Jews again. So they have to impose or to reintegrate and to bring to, to, to recreate Judaity and Judaism in themselves again in a new way. It was not the old way. It was very much different from the traditional way, the integral way in which Judaism, rabbinical Judaism, was transmitted from one generation to the other. So in all these phases, they were not quite Jews in an ordinary, not quite Jews in the very ordinary sense. They were they were different. There were others, there were the other within another society. Now, how did this phenomenon begin? Just a few, a few events and a few, if, a few if, if historical facts. In 1391, a wave of pogroms was, a storm of pogroms was covering Spain, Castile and Aragon, city by city, city by city from the smallest to the biggest, from Sevilla to the, to the provincial cities, Jews were persecuted. The mob, it was not organized by the government. It was, the government was very weak. 
It was the mob uh, that was, agit that, that was uh, driven by the lower clergy and w which forced the Jews to, st to, st to, to stand with, within a dilemma, 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 die or convert. The death or the cross. And waves of Jews succumbed. They converted under pressure, they converted under duress, they became Christians. Spanish Jewry, which was the crown of the Jewish diaspora for almost a millennium, did not collapse, but was broken, was crushed in one year. It took another 15 years in which more Jews were losing heart, in which the despair and, uh, and, and the pressure of the, of, a, of the environment created new waves of Jews who went to the font and became Christians, not under direct pressure, but under duress and because of a certain losing heart. We don't know numbers, but we know magnitudes and a big a great, mag in a great proportion of the, of the Spanish Jewry was lost to Judaism and converted into Christianity. At first, quite astonishing, astonishingly, they were, they were accepted, they were even welcomed into the, into the Hispano-Christian society. They came with the skills of the Jews, with financial skills, with a higher level of education, with a certain solidarity, Jewish solidarity, which now was no longer solidarity with the Jews. The Jews who remained Jews condemned them as, as renegades, but they became to have their own solidarity, their own group solidarity as Maranos, which helped them rise. And they rose within half Within a generation and a half, they, were, they rose in the society. They, they, they became the urban bourgeoisie. They went up to all the top jobs in the, in the, in the two kingdoms of Aragon and, uh, and Castille, Castilla. And uh, even the, even, they were even married into the aristocracy and, of course, went into the clergy and became many. Many of them became, became priests and, and bishops and so on. But that first assimilation was broken in, in uh, 1449, when resentment against their, you can compare it with the history of the Jews, of the assimilating emancipated Jews in 19th century Europe, in France, in Germany, and here in Holland. Resentment against their rising in the society, they were, they were as if emancipated from the old laws against the Jews because they were no longer Jews. They were brethren in Christ. No limitation was already relevant and could apply to them. So with the old energies, with the old faculties, with new, op new openings uh, available to them, they rose. And then they started to be resented. And since they could no longer be rejected on the ground of their religion, they were brothers in Jesus, they were officially Catholics. A new device was found in order to discriminate against them and to stop their advance. And that was their blood. They were declared in 1449, the first law, locally still, around Toledo, in, in a mutinous situation, in, in a situation of mutiny against the king. So it was, it was not, no, no, not yet an official policy, but it was the start of a movement in which the Toledo authorities, the, muni the, the rebellious Toledo authorities declared that, Christ that bad Christians who have impure blood cannot have any access to certain positions, public positions in government, in the church, in the universities, and so on and so forth. These were the first blood regulations against Jews in Europe. I say Jews in brackets, in con converted commas, because were they Jews? 
they were all Catholics. Many of them, perhaps the majority, wanted to assimilate, tried to assimilate. They still had their origin. And existentially, they were Jews because they came from Jewish families, from Jewish conversion, from a Jewish catastrophe. Culturally, they were already raised as Christians. Officially, they were brothers in Jesus. So who were there? They still were pointed out as bearing uh, impure blood. At first, as I said, this was a mutinous, marginal affair, but Toledo was nevertheless the most important town in, 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 in Spain. But later on, over the next century, those, those phenomena that regions, cities, Municip municipalities declare statutes against the Maranos on the ground of their having impure blood uh, spread out around the, the country until Philip II made them the law of the land and, and gave it to the Inquisition the role of checking everyone who wants a job, who wants to, be, to, to come to to be a bishop, to, to be a priest, or to want to be a professor, or wants to be a notary public, or whatever, to be checked for their, his parents, his grandparents, and so on, how much impure blood, if at all, he had, and to produce certificates of pure blood in order to get those jobs. Just to give you an example, a literary example, Cervantes, Miguel de Cervantes, who probably was from a Marano family, when he was a young man, he wanted to get a job serving a great a cardinal in uh, a Spanish cardinal had to bring, had to, it was in Rome, he had to ask his family in, back in Spain to produce uh, a statement of pure blood for him. And of course they did, because there was a whole industry in, in Spain producing those, uh, there, were, there was a, a lot of machers intermediaries who produce those for, money, for, for, for a fee. So uh, Cervantes has, could, could get the job. But we have many indications that this was a forgery, that this was fake, and he probably was of this impure blood himself. Then there was a problem the problem of the Moranos became a, the, the social problem number one in Spain. Most of the conflicts between the burghers in town, the old burghers, that's the, the middle class, the higher, the, well, I don't have to speak to, to explain in Amsterdam what burghers are. Uh, the Jews, the, the former Jews entered this class and they probably if they do not, did not create it completely because it was there already, it gave it a big push. They, they, they were responsible for the development of the, of the higher urban uh, class in, around, in, uh, around Spain. And of course, they were in competition with the old Christians, with the non-Jewish, non-Marano burghers who resented their, their ascent. So, Riots against them were produced all around Spain, and because of the other problems that were in Spain, I do not want, I don't have to, to go into them, political and social, and in great inflation, the, the riots against them were interwoven in all the other problems in Spain until it became, it looked as if this Morano problem is all over the place. It, some historians call it the biggest social problem in Spain in the second half of the 15th century. Then Isabella and Fernando united their kingdoms, came to power, and created the unified Spain, which you all know uh, create, uh, created the, the centralized government of Spain, so-called centralized government of Spain. And they created the Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was created by them in 1478, was, was created in, a, in an edict which said specifically that the purpose is to purge Spain from the bad Christians who pretend to be Christians but they are working against Christianity 
they are the, 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 the bad Christians, meaning the Maranos. That was the specific aim of the Inquisition, to clear, to purify Spain of the Maranos, not of the Jewish blood. It was not yet in, in, in uh, when it was created by Fernando and Isabel, it was not yet uh, a racist organization. Uh, they believed Torquemada, the great inquisitor that everybody knows his name, believed that you can, who probably was also from a Marano family, very, very probably, believed that you can completely change a person by water and by fire. And you don't need to, to touch their blood. Water means baptism. Once the Jew is baptized, this is a metaphysical event, a sacrament which transforms completely the person into a Catholic, into a brothers in Jesus, and into a member of the mystical corpus, which is the church. Water can do it. And if this person becomes a heretic, continues to, to Judaize, to keep Jewish customs or whatever customs he thinks is Jewish, are Jewish, because education, Jewish education was going down, uh, was, was diminishing. If this person Judaizes, that is to say, betrays, the, betrays the, his baptism or her baptism and becomes a heretic and an, 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 an enemy to the church and to Jesus, you can, you can correct this by fire, by burning him and saving his soul or her soul. So there was no blood yet involved in Torquemada in terms of, in terms of uh, pure and impure blood. But there was a very great, man, a very great flood of blood that he was letting by burning hundreds of people and then thousands of people that the greatest and the most brutal attack of the Inquisition was the first wave in which it was uh, instituted under Torquemada. And then, you, we all know, 1492, I'm just running from one known date to the other, the Jews were expelled from Spain completely. And why were the Jews expelled from Spain? Spain, Spain? There is an edict of expulsion, we all know, Again, Fernando and Isabel wrote and signed an edict of expel expulsion of the Jews. We call it expulsion. If you speak to a S Spanish scholar, he will tell you it was not just an expulsion. They, gave, they were given a choice. And the choice is if you want to stay, convert to Christianity. If you do not convert to Christianity, you should leave. So, uh, so to speak, the, G the, the Jews were given a, a choice. But what kind of a choice? Of course, it was, in, in all, for all practical purposes, an expulsion. And again, what was the reason given by the Catholic uh, kings, by Fernando and Isabel, for the, let's call it an expulsion? The reason was that the Jews who remain in Spain corrupt the Maranos, corrupt the new Christians, by helping them to Judaize, by giving them instructions, by giving them sometimes books, by sending them kosher, kosher meat and matzot for Passover and so on, so that they can keep their secret Jewish uh, customs, which of course from the viewpoint of the Inquisition and the, and the Spanish establishment was heretical and deserved being eradicated. And, since in, and, and they came to the conclusion that they cannot eradicate the sin and the plague of Judaizing as long as, Jews, as, as long as official Jews, legal Jews, exist in the country. They, they will always corrupt and contaminate the Maranos. So they have to leave. I'm giving you those examples that just to, to, to point out the importance of the Murano problem, both in terms of Spain itself and in terms of the fate of the Jews. Because the, the Inquisition, which by the way, did not persecute Jews. This should be understood. This is a, there is a, a misunderstanding about it. Many people believe the, the Inquisition was persecuting the Jews. 
The Inquisition had no jurisdiction over the Jews. The Jews were exempt from the ex jurisdiction of the, ex of the Inquisition. The Inquisition had jurisdiction only over Christians. Of course, the Moranos were considered Christians because they were baptized. So the Inquisition persecuted the Moranos, later on Lutherans, Calvinists, and so on. But at first, and mostly in, in a massive way, they persecuted the Moranos. And because people call the Moranos Jews, it comes, the, it created the, the, the legend as if the Inquisition was persecuting Jews. But the point is that the Moranos were not Jews. And I shall come back later on to what they, to, 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 to what they were and what they were not. But excuse me. Just My answer will be that they were, that they had, they were all marked by a duality, by different kind of duality, by a whole spectrum of forms of duality, of dualism, <clears throat> which I will explain in a moment. But before I want to finish the list of dates that I was starting with. The Jews who left, the Jews, the official Jews who re who refused to become Christians had to leave. Some went to Morocco, to Turkey, to the Ottoman Empire, which was always hospitable to the Jews. But most of them crossed the border to Portugal, which gave them, gave them shelter for, uh, for a limited time. And there in Portugal, they were trapped. Because five years later, the Portuguese king, Manuel I, for reasons I cannot, which are very interesting and has a romantic side, but I cannot tell the whole story. I mean, some, some of this I should leave you to read in the book. Um, forced all the Jews to convert without giving them the option of leaving. They were just trapped there. And who was trapped there? The most tenacious Jews, those Jews who were ready, who were, who were so tenacious as Jews that they were ready to leave their country, leave their, sell their homes for nothing, lo lose most of their properties, and move out of Spain, so in order not to become Jew Christians. They, these people, so tenacious, they, they went into Portugal, and there they were trapped five years later, in uh, 19, sorry, for, sorry? 97, six, seven, well, I remember seven. <laughs> yes, Manuel the first. And they did not have the alternative anymore to leave or to convert. But what they were given by, by uh, the king, the king wanted them, the king didn't want to, the, Manuel was then building the big commercial Portuguese empire that was to, to dominate the eastern part of uh, Asia until the Dutch came in as, 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 as his rivals, as, as the rivals of Portugal. And he needed the Jews. He needed them for his commercial enterprises. So he didn't want them to go. So he promised them, he told them, there will not be any questions asked. There will not be an inquisition for a number of time. It's 20 years, 30 years. There will be a, a a long time without an inquisition, no questions asked, just convert and remain. Now these took, these two, and it was true, it took, it took more than a generation for the inquisition, for this Portuguese inquisition to come into existence. It started only in 1536 or so, and it be, didn't became, become effective until mid, the mid-century. 
But when it became effective, it became more strenuous and more rigorous and more cru cruel even than the Spanish Inquisition, which by then became a little less than it used to be. And these factors combined, the fact that the Portuguese Moranos com were composed of a more tenacious Jewish element who left the second fact that they were let alone to Judaize in secret without the police and Inquisition and without too many questions asked for over a generation, a generation and a half. And finally, because at the, at the end, they got this strenuous Inquisition which forced them to unite their forces and to, be, and to create a lobby against the Inquisition in Rome and in other places. All these elements combined to make Portuguese Maranism longer lasting, stronger, more stubborn, and more stable than Spanish Maranism, which also explains why later on, about a century and more, and a century, a century and a half, and even more than that, when Marano started to leave, to emigrate, not many, but some, and in, in quite in important numbers, started to emigrate from, from uh, Spain and Portugal to the, the so-called dispersion of dias Marano dis diaspora, of which Amsterdam was more or less the capital. When they started doing it, they were known around the world as the Portuguese, not as the Spaniards, although many of them were Spaniards or half Spaniards. Even the Spaniards, again, many of them spoke Spanish, the literature was, was the literature in Spanish. May, uh, they were right, the, their, their authors and writers and so on wrote Spanish rather than Portuguese. Still, they were known as the Portuguese. And even in Amsterdam, of course, as you know, the, the congregation was known as the Portuguese Marano congregation. Uh, another point, and this, this, will, this, uh, this will conclude my my historical background. When the Spanish Inquisition became less rigorous and, this, and, the, and the Portuguese became more so, it occurred more or less during the, during the time when Portugal was annexed by Spain. It was annexed by uh, Philip II. And during this annexation, Portuguese merchants and others could go into Spain, could, could move into Spain and, 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 and live and work in Spanish cities. So many of these Moranos came back to Spain. Now, now as Portuguese Morano, they came back to Spain and uh, enjoyed the less stringent situation and, and control of the, of, the, of the Inquisition that existed in Spain. Now, let's ask another question now. What about the cultural identity of those Moranos? How do we understand the subgroups among them? Well, as I said before, one of my impressions of my thesis the, after, after reading all the, all the literature, most of so much literature about them. And when you think about, when you think about the, 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 the fact that you read there, including what the Inquisition writes about them and the way they are described by the inquisitorial prosecution and clerics and so on, you get two impressions. The, the superficial impression is that many of them were secret Jews on the one hand, and that many, perhaps more, have become complete, integrated, Hispano or Portuguese Christians, Catholics. When you go into the finesse, into the nu nuances of the, f of the phenomenon, and when you also have some critical thinking about it, 
You can see that the picture is, this is a very su superficial picture. The picture is much more complex, and it takes a whole book to describe its complexity, but in order to be a little superficial myself in, in one lecture, I would say that the common denominator of, of all, if not of most of... Oh, okay. The common denominator was duality. Different kinds of duality. There is not one single model for duality. There are varieties, different kinds of duality, and different degrees in every such kind of a duality. But the common duality denominator is that there is a duality, as I said before, a cultural duality, a split cultural identity, which sometimes leads to a split personal identity. And again, in different ways, split in different ways, not in a single, there's no single mold for that. Let's start by a very, very simple reflection. Then we'll go into more details. Here are people who were first Jews. Then they were Christians. Then they were both Jews and Christians because they mixed the two, especially in the early generations. And some at the end became neither Jews nor Christians because of this, this mixed this mixed uh, mixture of cultures and of religions. By the way, the explanation, one of the explanations to the phenomenon of Spinoza, which I offered in the books that uh, David mentioned before, the Spinoza and other heretics, is that he belonged to the last, to the last group, which was the smallest, namely that the fate and the existential situation <coughs> of Maranos in being First Jews, then Christians, then both Jews and Christians, and eventually some of them become neither Jews nor Christians, is the milieu, the psychological structure or pattern from which a person like Spinoza arose. But he arose, many others arose in the same way on a, on a more mediocre level. But he, because of his genius, arose in, the, in this explosive way in which we know, or, in, or those of us who are interested in know. But let us now divide very roughly the Moranos in general, the new Christians, into the following, let's say, four or five groups. Again, the Judaizers, the assimilated, the early secularizers, and those who will, whom I shall call the spiritual seekers. Let's start with the Judaizers. Judaizers were thought to be, as I said before, the legend describes them as crypto Jews who are completely Jewish inside and put up uh, a completely, a merely, a merely Christian exter externality, facade. They are split, of course. The duality is clear. They are split between the, in, in the interior and the exterior, between the inner and the outside. But contrary to the common image, they are not split in a neat, in a neat, strong way. So that the exterior is one third and the interior is another thing. The interior must influence the exterior, and the exterior must influence the interior. You cannot live as a Christian, get an education as a Christian, get no education as a Jew except for some knowledge that your grandmother tells you about what, you, what Jews do on Friday night or, on, Sat or on, on Yom Kippur or on Passover, Matzot, okay. And this very meager theology that they were, get, that they were getting when they were told, you, we are a special group, we are saved in Jesus, sorry. We are saved in Moses and not in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is different, and ours is the true salvation. They will not be saved. Jesus, Jesus saves nobody. Moses saves, and Mo, Mo, the salvation by Moses is our secret. This they all knew. 
But what does Moses mean? What do you do? What do you believe? How do you, f how do you, how do you go about being a Jew? We know that being a Jew has, is a daily business. It's not just believing. First of all, it's not so much the belief in a dogma. This, this itself is a Catholic f feature, to believe in a dogma and to, be, and to think that you are saved by your belief in a dogma. This is not a Jewish structure, a mental or religious structure at all. Also, putting, the, main, putting, putting the, main, the, the problem of salvation at the center of one's religious life is a very Christian thing. I mean, the whole Reformation, the whole, the whole of the religious wars between Catholics and Protestants was revolving around this problem. What saves? Sola, fides, or sacraments, or whatever. This is a, basically a Christian problematic. Jews are interested in salvation. Yes, every Jew wants to, come, wants to go to the second world, or Lama Ba. But that's not the center of, of one's religiosity. The center of one's religiosity in Judaism usually is the commandments and a certain way of life in a, in a Jewish community. So you are, raised in this, <clears throat> you are raised in this education. You know very little of what does it mean to, to, to be a follower of Moses. Your theology is in, and, and the symbolism in which you understand the world and in, interpret the world come from your Catholic education. And yet you, you say, no, 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 but I am a Jew. And in, you, in your will, you want to be a Jew. In your will, you decide that this is what you are. But the outside, the Catholic culture, is imbued into the way you think of yourself as a Jew and you believe yourself to be a Jew. And also vice versa. The fact that you do not accept Catholicism as it is, that you have this secret against organ organized, organized Spanish Cat or Portuguese Catholicism, means that your Catholicism, the outside, is affected by the inside. It is broken, it is fractured. It is not an integral identity either way you look upon it. The, and we also know that human beings externalize their inner world and adopt into their in interiority elements from the outer world. And why should the Maranos be different from any other human being? Now, <clears throat> the Inquisition specialized in catching and in persecuting what it called you Judaizers. When you read the records of many of those people who were condemned and declared as Jude, to be Judaizers, not all of them were burnt, of course, only a small minority. Most of them were forced to recant, to confess their, their aid, and to serve other penalties. But the records are there, and they are called Judaizers. And you see what it means to be a Judaizer. Many very often, you see that the person was split. The person has a, had a duality. He or she thought of herself as a Catholic, but a different Catholic. A, a Catholic which, which demands the right to keep some Jewish beliefs, to keep some Jewish habits, to keep some Jewish foods, to keep some Jewish elements in, in, their, in their identity. And the Inquisition denies them this right. If you do this, you will be, you will be condemned in out of the fan. If you do it the second time, you will be burned. You have to have a, an identity which is inter, in an integral well Catholic. And they do not want. They want to have this mixed identity. They want to to have elements of both. This, many Judaizers are like that. Others who are condemned as Judaizers have manifested something that you can call nostalgic Judaism. That is to say, they remembered certain prayers, certain songs, certain chants, certain foods. Food is the last element of of collective identity to disappear, as we know. Every sociologist will tell you that. They, they were nostalgic to their own childhood, their, to, 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 
the, the elements they, they remembered from a Judaizing home or from, from a really Judaizing home, I will come in, in a moment to that, uh, or from their own childhood before the conversion and so on. That does, and so he can, he can chant a song, he can chant a prayer, he can do some, he can, he can put on a talit, he can do something, it's, it's a, he can eat something uh, that reminds him of his past. But there is no intention to, to go on being Jewish. It is only nostalgic. The Inquisition declares them to be completely Judaizers and condemns them accordingly. So there is a certain superfici superficiality, we might say, in the, of course, intentional superficiality, uh, in the attitude of the Inquisition, who declares people to be secret Jews when they are this mixture, this combination, these this different kinds of dualities. Still, there were also Judaizers, people who kept certain Jewish uh, customs in secret without the, with the intention to be Jews, with a very strong intention, sometimes very heroic intention, being, being ready to sacrifice a lot and to take great risks for their Judaism, for their Judaity. But again, if you look what was the Judaity that they were taking those sacrifices with for, if you even s examine, as my colleague Nathan Vashtel, the great French anthropologist, uh, looked upon some of the martyrs of the Ju Judaizing martyrs in Latin America, because they, they emigrated to Latin America, to the Spanish and to the Portuguese position, possessions uh, overseas. And he analyzed what they were giving their lives for it was very far away from what we understand as Orthodox Judaism. It's a very heterodox, it, it often was a heterodox Judaism, in the, or in the, in the best case, a very impoverished Judaism, which no rabbi would accept. By the way, the fact that the rabbis did not accept them, and the priests did not accept them, made them very, very lonely make them the other of both religions. This is one of the reasons I call my book The Other Within. They are within, but within they are the other. For the Christian, they are the others. For the Jews, they are the other. They're always the other. They're the epitome of the other. They are hanging in the air with all their different kinds and patterns, they are hanging in the air. Now let's talk about the, the second big group, large group. Namely, they're assimilating, those who are assimilated. Probably the majority over time because the phenomenon lasted for centuries. If not in the first generation, if not in the second generation, if not in the fifth generation, eventually they wanted to assimilate. And some of them wanted to assimilate all the way from the first generation on. How were they accepted by the society? They were not accepted as real partners. Remember, impurity of blood. They were, they were accepted sometimes socially because of the money they made, because of the position they gained, because of the learning and, and, it's, and, and above all the service that they paid to the authorities to the government, to the local government, to the... But basically, fundamentally, they were regarded as pari, paria because of, they had impure blood. And this was mixed with socioeconomic competition and socioeconomic rejection on, as I said before, on the level of the urban bourgeoisie. So some of them, in, in addition, sorry, in addition, some of them, when they, in the first generation, then when they tried to assimilate, they brought all their Jewish <laughs> baggage into Christianity. 
And they were thinking the, 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 the Jewish, uh, the Jewish, uh, sorry, they, they were thinking the Christian beliefs and, and customs in terms of the Jewish terms in which they were educated. So the duality worked both in terms of the education and in terms of the social and political situation in the, in the host uh, society. Also, when they brought the Jewish baggage with them, part of this Jewish baggage was the great skepticism that the Jews were always had vis-a-vis -vis the Christian Catholic dogma. How can God be three? How can God become a man? How can you say that the Messiah, Messiah has already come when you look at the world and that the world is not redeemed at all? So skepticism became another, the third group that I, was, I want to, to, to analyze is the group of the skeptics. Skepticism about Christianity became very marked among them. But skepticism about Judaism too has started because when you are thrown into two religions, you are thrown into this, to a certain position in which relativity becomes to loom upon you. Which is the true religion? Is there a true religion? If, if, I, if I have the right to reject this religion, why don't I have the right to reject, to reject the other religion? Why don't I have the right to reject all historical religions and perhaps, and perhaps think for myself and, and, and rely upon my own personal judgment rather than, rather than on, on, on intellectual and religious authorities, one or the other. This is not only an intellectual process that goes in the skeptics' minds, it is also an existential situation. Torn in the duality of two religions competing over me, I can say they are both both are liable to criticism, perhaps both are wrong. And, and when we look upon the careers of many of the Moranos, even those assimilated, we see that most of them run from religious problems to daily life, and they invest their energies, their power, their talents, in this worldly affairs, not in the affairs of the other world, not in the question, how am I to be um, saved? What is, the, what is the true way to supernatural salvation? This world becomes the important focus of one's efforts and the important focus of one's talents. The career, the family, making money, Going, making it in the Christian society, going up in the world, uh, this, this becomes, and the saying starts to run among Maranos from the very first generation, which reverberates in the records of the Inquisition. There is only living and dying, and the rest I don't know. There is only living, you only live and you die, and the rest I don't know. Now to this, another element was, this, was this, this worldliness, this element of this worldliness of terrestrial kind of life was also reinforced because of the purity of blood laws against the Moranos. The purity of the blood law basically relies upon the Spanish basis of normativity in which the value is attached to a person according to their origin, where they come from, their descent, and to s their blood. And to say that it comes from a Jewish origin means that your blood is contaminated, and so you have no worth and no value as a person. And this is the fate. This is not something, this is an existential fate. It is not something that depends upon who you, who you personally are, what you do, what your achievements are, nothing. All depends upon your, the blood that was given to you by your descent. And this became a object of opposition to all groups of Maranos. No matter if they were Judaizing or assimilated or skeptics 
or all the subgroups, which I do not have time to analyze it before you, all the groups were united in rejecting this value system in which blood is important, the most important denominator of your value, of your worth. And instead, they said, what really counts is not how you were born, but you, what you have achieved yourself. Your achievement, your personal achievement in the world, your personal, your personal achievement in the world are what defines the worth, your, your human worth and your social worth. This goes against the grain of the Spanish value system. But it was, of course, shared by all those who were the victims of the impure blood regulations and, you op and you, who opposed those regulations. It's your virtue, personal virtue. It's the purity of your heart, not of your blood. It's the greatness of your achievements. It's who you are. And this combined to the, this, this reinforced the, the, the concept or the, 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 the pattern of this worldliness, which became very important for the Moranos, being interested in the affairs of this world in which you can advance, achieve, and thereby build for yourself the worth, the value, which the Spanish blood system denies to you. This all led also to secularism, to early secularism. And we find, we find uh, examples of early rejection of all religions and, 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 and emphasis on secularity in the Marano, in many Maranos, uh, in the Marano, Marano phenomenon generally. But I want to still speak about the, still a different group. How am I with time? I don't, I don't even tend. Eight is okay. <laughs> I called them before the spiritual seekers, and let me explain what I mean, mean by that. Now, we are here we are talking about a group of people who were more intellectually sensitive and who were also sensitive to religion, that, to religiosity. That is to say, they were the opposite of the secularists. I spoke about the secularists who became disworldly, who became, who, be, who, who, reject, who, who basically rejected all historical religions and became secular. These people, on the contrary, were Maranos who had in their person a certain sensitivity for religion for religiosity, but they could not accept the Spanish Catholic religion as it was. Spanish Catholic religion was, I, was very rigid, very external, based upon formalism, based upon the objectivity of the sacraments, and not upon belief not so much upon belief, the inner heart, the ex religious experience, and everything that goes with what we call today interiority. It was the re religion of, it's, I'm caricaturing a little, but read Erasmus, read Luther, read, read all the literature of the time, and you will see how, how external and ossified Spanish Catholicism in general at the time and, and Spanish Catholicism in particular was. And these Maranos said, okay, I want to be a Christian. My intention is to integrate into the Christian society and become a Hispano-Catholic. But I cannot integrate into this Catholicism. This is not a religion. This is ossified, this, is, this has no spirit. I want a better religion. I want a better Christianity, a more internal Christianity, a more emotional Christianity, a Christianity built upon the spirituality and not upon works, not upon sacraments, but upon what's going on 
inside me. So they became reformers inside Spanish Catholicism. And they created, not only they, but they were the catalysts and in, in, in very, in, 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 to a great extent, they created a new Hispanic Catholicism, which may be called the religion of the interior and has been called the religion of the interior. And we have lots of writings and poems and pamphlets uh, written by them. And of course, they were persecuted by the Inquisition because they saw in, in them uh, potential Lutherans because of the similarity of uh, their, their attitude. And they believed also that they will be thereby better Christians than the old Christians. The old Christian called them new Christians in a derogatory sense. It was a kind of a negative epitaph, new Christian. New Christian meaning have, you, have, you, you, have, you, you are not a real Christian, you are a bad Christian, and especially you have impure blood. And they could say, no, we are good Christians, we are better Christians than you because we are the Christians of the heart, and we have a pure heart, which is more important than pure blood. We have pure heart as Christians. So from a Christian viewpoint, we are better than you are. But that, of course, is a form of duality. It means that you cannot be integrated into the Hispano-Catholic society as it is. You have to become a dissenter in order to be in order to join it. You can join it only as a dissenter. You cannot join it <coughs> as an Orthodox member. You can join Hispano-Catholicism only as a dissenter from within and take the risks that this entails. So, you, he, so, so this also gives a, a mine of, of forms of duality that come, that come out of this, this predicament. And it is not, it is not, a mere, it is not uh, astonishing that the Moranos thereby became the great initiators of the Spanish mysticism of the 16th and the 17th century that some of the greatest figures of Spanish mysticism, also some of the lowest, but some of the greatest figures of Spanish mysticism came from a Marano background. Above all, Santa Teresa of Avila, who is perhaps the greatest figure in Spanish, myst in Spanish mysticism and the patron saint of Spain. And that many of them became dissenters and were persecuted by the Inquisition, not as Jews anymore, but as dissenting Christians for whom, as former Jews, this dissent was the condition sine qua non to become Christians at all. Now, let me tell you what I didn't sp speak about. I didn't speak about the Marano diaspora, how they spread over the world and brought their their split identity, their forms of split identity to every corner of the world where there were commerce and where they came to. And how, in many ways, their special predicament anticipated certain forms of Western modernity and of Jewish modernity. But if I have time during the question period, maybe I can slip some of these elements into my answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, this is work? Yes, thank you very much for painting this beautiful picture of the Maranic landscape and showing the fascinating diversity also of the Murano culture. And I think we there are many people that will want to ask some questions, so you will have opportunity to slide in some, some more. Can that be done? I cannot see the audience. It's in my eyes. This is better, right? Well, the lower the better. 
Okay, are there questions? Wait, wait, uh, please wait. Could you repeat your question? Fri um, it is very emotional, your lecture, very emotional. Um, I would know, uh, you say Santa Teresa de Avila, also Fray Luis de Leon. Yes. Yeah? Yes, certainly. Oh. Fray Luis de Leon was, was the greatest. Fray Luis de Leon was the greatest Hebraist of Spain at that time. And his Marano dual, he was a certainly of Marano descent. He was. Yes, correct. And his his duality comes to bear in the fact that he that he demanded to go back to the to the Hebrew texts of Shira Shirim of the Song of Songs, which is the basic allegory for for religious mystics. And he did not want to be a Jew anymore but he wanted his Hebraic culture to play a role in his Christianity. And that's a for, that was his form of, of, of uh, dualism. And as you said, he was uh, arrested by the Inquisition. It wasn't 20 years, it was five or, or six. But he, and he wrote beautiful po poems while he was in prison. And when he came back, as you said, you're absolutely right, he came back, he was reinst reinstated as a professor and he said, as I said yesterday, and he went on from where he stopped six years before. 20 is too much. Well, thanks. Uh, just one question. Uh, it is my understanding that the Inquisition was a French invention. Not was what? A French invention. I mean, it was developed in Spain. French invention. But it was invented in France. Only the French have the skill to hide all the dark side of the history. <laughs> and, and another question. Um, do you think the, um, this duality and is at the base of the, the, like the two Spains that came then to clash like in the Civil War and also at the base of the two Hollands that you can see a very liberal Holland and a very Calvinist Holland and because Holland also had a big Sephardi influence and um, do you yes. think there might be any relation to that? Well, three questions, very big questions about the Inquisition. About the Inquisition being invented by the French, I don't want to put my head into the European problems, but I don't think this, this is fair to say. The Inquisition, you probably mean that the Inquisition operated first in uh, Languedoc, which is today part of, which is, was then part of France. It was not instituted by the king of France. The inquisition that worked in Languedoc before the Spanish inquisition was the Pope's inquisition. But the papal inquisition that was, were sent there to smash the Qatar heresy. And this inquisition in Languedoc belonged to the Pope, not to the, it, of course Languedoc is in France, but it belonged to the Pope. The Spanish inquisition was started by the Spanish state by Fernando and Isabel, the king and the queen, and they, and they demanded that the, it will be under, under their jurisdiction, not under the Pope's jurisdiction. So there's a difference. About uh, the two Spains, this I don't know. Uh, I, th I think that Moranos eventually participated in both sides of the two Spains. They were not only on one side. And as for Holland, I am not, I didn't come to Amsterdam to teach the Dutch about their own country. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to ask uh, the word Maranos. What does it mean and is there any connection to Islamic terminology of Jews? Well, there is a big debate about the origin of the word. Nobody knows. The most, uh, the, the, the most prevalent uh, view theory is that Marano meant pig at the time, and that because they were designated as pigs, uh, eventually the, the word became a neutral word or became, uh, became a descriptive, in our, in our language of course, it's the descriptive term and not, uh, 
uh, some people connected to the Hebrew term Maran Atta, you are my, you are my rabbi. And there are other such speculations. It's, nobody really knows. But of course, it, something we know that it used to be a very negative term. And that today, some people ask me, why are you using the negative term Marano? Why not call him New Christian? And my answer is that the, the term New Christian at the time was as negative as Marano. Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Sorry? It, it, it's written in the Quran that Jews are uh, worse than pigs and, and, uh, and dogs. I don't, think, I don't think it comes from the Quran. No. I think that it comes from the, it comes from the Spanish uh, popular parlance. You did not speak of uh, the Andalusian culture of the Muslim influence and also of the shared fate by Muslims in Spain uh, who were also uh, expulsed or threatened, uh, forced to convert, uh, convert, and when they converted they were mistrusted and they were believed not to be real converters. Can you say anything more about them? Was there a mutual influence of uh, Muslim culture and Judaic culture and uh, also after this conversion. I also understood that also a part of the Muslim expulsed moved uh, uh, to Latin America too. I don't know whether that is true or whether you know more about that. Um, these are two questions, different questions. The, the impact of the Muslims on Spanish culture was immense. But it, it goes back to the Middle Ages, not then. It goes back to the times before the Reconquista. That is to say, between the 7th and the 12th or 13th century. Uh, after the Reconquista, the, two, the 200 years in which Spain was practically Muslim Rhine, except for Granada, which was, which was uh, conquered in in 1492. Uh, later, later influence of the Muslims on Spanish culture, I don't think, is, uh, is nearly as important as the decisive influence of the, of, the Span of the Muslim culture on Spain during the Middle Ages. As for the, the Muslims that were expelled from, from Spain, well, you're right. Well, they, they were no longer Muslim. They were, they were called Moriscos. And Moriscos were a kind of Arabs or Muslim, former Muslims who were converted to Christianity and who, kept to, and who kept even more than the Jews their Muslim habits in the areas of Valencia and, uh, and uh, southern, southern uh, Spain, the southern part of the peninsula. And they were more organized because they lived together. They even, they even rebelled against the government once. And they were considered, they were considered a problem in, 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 but they were officially also Christians, Christians. And they suffered on both sides. And it was a great tragedy. And in 1607, I believe, it was 1608, they were brutally expelled from Spain without giving any option to stay because they were already uh, Catholics, especially. And they moved mostly, mostly to, I don't know about not Latin America, I, I, I'm not saying yes or no, and perhaps a few, but their main wave went to uh, North Africa, and what happened, Berberia they call it, Berberi. And what happened in North Africa, they were, they were received as Christians. The Muslims, they received them as Christians and rejected them. And they were really, I mean, I think that some, someone should write a book called The Other Within about, about their fate, because it was a very, very tragic fate. And you can, you can read about the reverberations of this fate in Don Quixote. There is a Morisco coming back in Don Quixote, and he describes all the dualities 
and all the tragedy of the Morisco, of the Morisco uh, expulsion in the second in Don, in Don Quixote Part Two. There's another question here. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask because 1391 is like the year, like the big year that the big population of Jews was converted to Christianity. Can you Christianity. please speak into the mic? Because I don't oh, know. sorry. <laughs> 1391 is like accepted as the big year that a lot of Jews were converted, like forcibly converted to Christianity. But uh, what do you think was the the cause of the like the the change in the uh, Spanish society that, because uh, in the Middle Ages it's like uh, you had the convivencia of the Middle Ages and then there was this change that started to yes. emerge in Spanish society. That well, it's hard to say. The intolerance. Right. It's hard to say for sure, but uh, first of all, what you call the convivencia was not under the cross, it was under the Muslims. When the Reconquista took possession of almost the whole peninsula, the situation of the Jews started to deteriorate. But they, it was still stable, more or less, until the early part of the 14th century when uh, there were a few great catastrophes. First of all, let me put it this way. During the Christian rule for the 13th and 14th centuries, the official doctrine also expressed by the kings, and especially by King Alfonso, Alfonso X, who is known as Alfonso the Sage in his poetry, was that the Jews are the enemies of Christ, but they have to be, we, we have to put up with them because we need, we need them in the administration. So the, legitim the legitimacy of their existence became shaky, and what kept them in existence was their need for them as servants, mostly for the royal, royal government. <clears throat> then in the early 14th century came the Black Death, the great plague that, 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 that uh, destroyed uh, a good part of the population of Europe, and the Jews were blamed for it in Spain. Not only in Spain, in Germany, of course, there were pogroms against them, but there they, 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 became t they started to be seen in a very obnoxious way. And later on came the civil war between the civil war in which the Jews were persecuted for political and killed for political reasons by both sides. So the, legitima the legitimacy of their existence diminished their image became more demonic, which was not the case before, since, the, since the, the, the plague. And finally, uh, there was a need, f the, there was the, the, pop the populace, the simple people hated them. What we call today anti-Semitism anti was, was rampant. And what was needed was a clerical legitimation to hurt the Jews. A clerical, coming from the church. And the high authority of the church refused to give it. But then there were rebellious clerics who came from the people. One of them was, was known as uh, the Archdeacon deacon of Esicha. And they provided, in a rebellious way, the the delegitimization of the Jews in, the, in, 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 in Spain. And that helped the, the eruption of the pogroms. And then when the pogroms started, one news about the pogroms in one place started the pogrom in another place, according to a very known, <coughs> known uh, dynamic. 
So these are the elements of the explanation that I can provide. They are not sufficient. It is still a debate, and it is still partly a mystery, but at least those elements existed. <coughs> there was a question here, or two questions <coughs> even. Shortly. I have a question about uh, Spinoza, your opinion about Spinoza. Um, Spinoza was not in um, Milano, but his parents were. In what way was he influenced in his philosophy from this um, duality, you think? Spinoza was not a Marano in the sense. <clears throat> Spinoza was not a Marano in the sense that he was not born a Christian. He was born already a new Jew. But he lived in a community here in this town in which the great majority of people around him were former Maranos, that is to say, Came from, came from Spain and Portugal as Christians and converted here or converted in Ferrara or converted in Venice and then came here so that they were born and educated as Christians, including the, be, including the person in, in honor of whom this institute is called, Menashe ben Israel, whose real name, real name, his, his early name was uh, Suero and he was born a Christian. So these people came here, they decided that they want to be Jews, but they didn't know what Jews, being a Jew mean, even means. They had to figure it out. They had to bring in a rabbi from, from Venice and a rabbi from Hamburg to tell them what Judaism is all about. And, wh and whatever they were told, they reinterpreted and took in according to Christian concepts and symbolism which they brought in, in here in their mental baggage. So that the, this, the duality is very clear, the, 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 their duality is very clear. Some of them, not only Spinoza, there was also his friend uh, Dr. De Prado and others, Uriel Acosta, da Costa before him, because of the confusion of Judaism and Christianity, decided that neither Judaism nor Christianity is true. You have to be, you have to follow your own, your own mind and follow universal human reason, which is neither Jewish nor Christian nor Muslim, but universal. And this is where you have to develop the truth, not from the revelation, the Jewish or the Christian revelation, but from reason as you understand it, and you have to develop your own mind in order to understand it. And that brought them out of the existentially, it's not no, existentially, this is something that happened to, to them because of the way they were, the place they were born and the, the way they were, they were encountering other people. So it was something, it was the more, the more the situation than their mind which broke the, the links to the two religions. And once they were in the air, up in the air without the religion, they were looking for a philosophical religion. Tell you an anecdote. The Spanish Inquisition had informers here in Amsterdam because Amsterdam had a lot of Spanish community. These people were Spaniard, Catholic Spaniards who came here. So one of them, or two of them actually, report about Spinoza and about his friend Daniel de Prado. And they come to Sevilla and they come to the office of the Inquisition and they say, Here's what's going on in among, among those, uh, among those uh, new Christians in Amsterdam. And there is this guy, Spinoza, there is this guy Spinoza and his friend De, De Prado, and he, he describes Spinoza, his features, and so on, his age. Spy has to give age, features. And then he says, they have left the Jewish community or kicked out what They were kicked out by the Jewish community and they believe, and they no longer believe in the religion of the community. They are looking for a philosophical, they, have, they believe in God only philosophically and they are still looking for something to believe in. 
And that's the Inquisition telling about telling you a story about Spinoza. And that's probably, in a very crooked way, it was quite true. So after all, these Inquisition sources are very uh, authentic and valuable. <laughs> we, no, not credible. Without the Inquisition sources, we, I would not be here to here today, and we would know uh, next to nothing about them. But you have to read the Inquisition sources very critically. You see, those Jewish, those good Jewish scholars who want to embrace the, all the Moranos and, 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 and make all of them good Jews, and so they look at the Inquisition, the Inquisition calls him a Jew, they call him a Jew. But the Inquisition calls him a Jew, Judaizers, because of many simplified and, and, and simple-minded reasons, as which I explained before. So don't fall victim to the Inquisition. If the Inquisition calls okay. him a Jew, you check him out. Only when they write on Spinoza, they are credible. Sorry? Only when it, it, uh, they write on Spinoza, uh, they are credible. No, you have to interpret what they say. Okay, okay, no, I understand. You have to interpret what they say. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> this was a wonderful lecture. Um, and uh, this concludes our lecture series of, of this year. Um, uh, because of that, uh, it was also a long day for some of you, because earlier this day there was also a, a, um, um, a conference on anti-Semitism, and uh, there are here some diehards who went to both the conference and also this lecture. Um, I uh, want to take this opportunity after this long day also to say a word of thanks to uh, Margreet Witvoet and Esther Beik, who are also work on the Manasseh Ben Israel Institute and did a lot of work to make this all possible organizationally. Um, and then finally I'd like to um, uh, uh, ask you to consider seriously to look at the leaflets we put on the chairs and to think of becoming a donateur, a friend of our institute, which is uh, something that really helps us. And if you like these kinds of events and these lectures, uh, you will really support us uh, uh, when you become um, a donateur. Thank you very much. Uh, the cafe is open, I think, until one o'clock at night. So there is plenty opportunity to discuss and talk further of on this lecture or the other lectures we had today. Terry.